welcome to the Creative Economy, How Networks Shape Creative Ecosystem Session. My name is Claire Reddington. I'm the CEO of Watershed in Bristol in the UK and a trustee of the British Council. And I'm going to be your host for this session. I'm a middle-aged woman wearing a green top. I've got short grey hair and glasses and I'm sat in front of a wall of pictures. So this session is part of Partner SEA, Art and Culture Matters event, which is hosted by the British Council. It runs between the 22nd and the 25th of November, as I'm sure you all know, because you're here. And we're going to take the audience on a journey through Southeast Asia, exploring arts and culture of Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Thailand and Vietnam. As I hope you know, the British Council builds connections, understanding and trust between people in the UK and other countries through arts, culture, education and the English language. And lots of the work that we do at Watershed in Bristol is influenced and supported by these networks which span across the world. This session is going to focus on creative economy and particularly the significance of networks in building stronger and more inclusive creative economies. The conversations will tell stories of impact generated through networks from the points of view of creative hubs, creative entrepreneurs and cities. And we've got a little bit of a twist. We all miss being in one room at the same time for these kinds of events. So we've asked an artist to imagine the session as if it's taking place in real life, a kind of virtual dinner party, if you will. So um, Danny Go is an illustrator and cartoonist from the Philippines, um, and they're coming along for this uh, pretty swift ride to translate the conversations into an imagined gathering. Um, Danny has not seen any of us, but is going to base the artwork on what they can hear. So we're just going to go and have a quick look at Danny's screen. Hi, Danny. Um, we're going to come back to your screen throughout the discussion to check on your progress. But do you want to say hello to the audience? Hi, everyone. Hope you enjoy the session. <laughs> Great. I can see you're sketching out that dinner party right now. Um, so I can't wait to see what you managed to create in this. Stay tuned, everybody. So um, I'm going to ask all of our speakers today to start by um, describing themselves in the way that I did at the beginning of the session. Um, for all of you, there's some house rules, which I think will be listed in your chat. Um, but we're, uh, we've got a pretty short amount of time. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, welcome our first speaker, Dr. Marlene Komorowski. So Marlene is an impact analysis for Cardiff University's Creative Economy Unit, which is a partner of ours just across the water from Bristol, um, a senior researcher and guest professor um, in Brussels. And today she's going to share her most recent report, Joining the Dots, understanding the value generation of creative networks, where she's uh, analyzed the impact of creative networks on creative ecosystems. So a perfect place for us to start today. Uh, Marlene. Thank you very much, Claire, and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Marlene. I am in the beginning of my 30s, have blonde hair, wear a black top and have my hair in a, um, in a pigtail sitting in my living room. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for the nice introdu introduction, Claire. So I can get right away into my presentation. I hope you can see it on your screens. If not, let me know. Um, basically my research focuses on every topic related around creative industries, ecosystems, networks, innovation, creation. So I'm very happy that I was asked and invited today to present my latest research here today on the value generation of creative networks. And I will have to go quite fast through my presentation. So uh, I will give you in the end the links to the full report if you want to read up on it and the article which was just published by an academic journal. So on to the presentation real quick. So um, what are creative networks? I think that's quite a good start into this session here today. Um, what we did in the research specifically, we focus on creative network organizations. So especially the organi organized part, and we really wanted to focus on the network, the place and creativity within the network. So 
in this study, we defined creative networks as city, town or region wide networks that cover multiple creative sectors, which is rooted in place and working for the place and is in operation for a minimum of one year. So we wanted to look at um, networks that have already been in place for some time and that work for creative individuals and creative organizations. That to say creative networks can be all kind of networks. So not only these very organized ones, but also of course, um, more uh, bottom up initiatives or just by connecting what we do here right now, we might create a network ourselves. But in this research, we really focused on these organizations which are in place there to create these networks. So why should we study and understand creative networks? Um, what uh, we all know, and you probably will hear throughout these sessions um, and maybe have heard already today, is how important the creative industries has become, especially in the UK, as one of the biggest drivers of economic growth and being part of the UK economy. So by today, it is bigger, the creative industries is bigger than the automotive, aerospace, life science, oil and gas industries all combined. Um, also what we have seen, um, what we now see from the British Council's perspective, a lot of policy makers, organizations being more and more interested in creative industries. And already for some time, we have found that a lot of companies, organizations and research has pointed out how important networks are for the creative industries. So what that's where we started our research of like, okay, that's what's going on. So we want to understand more and better what is happening there and why and, and how do creative networks actually work. So just briefly, the findings um, that our research came up with and what we have found is most interesting. We have analyzed a total of 22 creative networks in the UK. As you can see, they're quite well distributed along all of the UK uh, organizations. Um, and I'm especially involved with Creative Cardiff, for example, in Wales, which is part of the university. Cardiff University is an organization that um, brings all of the creative industries in the city together. And this is kind of the specific characteristics that all of these creative networks share. There are either independent organizations or part of a larger um, organization um, and do activities for the creative industries. And we have worked with them in two workshops together and a survey to find out how they are creating value. So this is the big result. It's a visualization of the creative um, networks, value networks. So we use the value network analysis approach. This is a lot to take in. So let me just briefly go through it in more detail. But the idea was basically that we have um, looked at the organizations that are within the network and how these organizations are um, connected to each other through value flows and therefore create value for the society and economy as a whole. And within this, we identified four main actor groups that are active within creative networks and that the network brings together. This has been coined as the quadruple helix approach in literature already. It's especially for innovation creation an approach that a lot of um, researchers take. And what we have found, looking at all of these different um, networks that we find, there is always a, the government involved, academia, so universities, colleges, but also schools, um, civil society organizations, and the industry. And how they all are brought together through the creative network in the middle as kind of the spider in the web of bringing all of these different groups together is through four main uh, value flows monetary service and knowledge flows, collaboration and cooperation flows, and something that we coined as non-tacit values. So a distinctive feature of most creative networks is that the degree to which economic value is, is that the economic value is only one part of the complex value system, but it also embraces a range of economic, cultural and societal values. By its very nature, the creative industries engage in various forms of social meaning and intervention. And this was really a key highlight for us because the creative industries are so active also in cultural spheres, in arts, um, 
also in a societal impact uh, generation, um, creative networks really are important also for uh, the something that goes beyond the economic value that normally is only embraced by value networks, by other industries, by other networks. And I have here a little bit of a more detailed overview, but I don't have time today to go into detail. So I just want to show you a little bit how all of these actors are connected. So specifically, we'll find how the government is con connected to the creative network in my report. The academia um, is connected, how the civil society, which is also now where we are here. Um, we see British Council, for example, also as one of the actors within the civil society as an organization, which brings us now here together. Um, and the industry. And here I want to just briefly highlight what we found. It's not only specific for the creative industries, but also the wider economy and ICT, bringing creatives within all of these different um, economic sectors and helping them to collaborate and, and network there. So I'm using my last two minutes to highlight my conclusions. So the first big lesson I want to highlight for everyone here and that we hopefully can pick up in the conversations after my presentation is that um, the creative industries have specific characteristics and that's what so makes networks so important and so unique in the creative networks because if we look at other industries like pharma manufacturing um, other industries that are very innovative all of these have very large organizations uh, being the capable organizations to bring companies together to work with other ones together but the creative industries is mostly composed of small uh, micro businesses freelancers it's very project driven so there is a lack of capacities for networking that's why we see how important network organizations and how important it is to network within the creative industries it's something very different than is happening in other sectors and that, that's why it's so important to look at it and embrace it as well um, the second lesson I want to highlight is, like I said, it's not only about economic values, bringing you together in a, a network and working together. No, it's also a lot of non-tested values that are being created through networks. This can go from identity formation to placemaking, as well as other more intrinsic and not so easy measurable measures, measure, um, values that impact the industry that impacts society, that impact how we work together. Um, so this is quite often overlooked because economic impact of a network can be measured. I had a new project, we have more industry growth, but this is really what networks are also about and that uh, we wanted to highlight in our report. And the final lesson um, being that we still find that the role of networks is quite underestimated it's not understood so a little bit what we try to do with this report and research is to try to create a common um, knowledge base for everyone of understanding of what creative networks are and how they function but also on um, in terms of the vocabulary how can we formulate what is happening in creative networks how can we formulate um, and, and measure and create ideas about the value impact it's creating so there is still a huge gap in our opinion. It's not that much research out there and the lack of understanding, especially from policymakers, which quite often are needed to support these networks. And that's what we try to encourage with this research findings that we need to invest more into these networks because they become so essential. And as you can see here, I think the slides will be shared, uh, the links to both the academic article and the full report for you for checking out in more detail so thank you very much Marlen thank you so much there is so much to dig into there um, as you say the importance of um, like really making the case for the network organizers the people that hold these spaces and and sort of uh, promote and catalyze that growth um, behind the scenes I can see the illustrations starting to take shape and I can see that me and you are sat next to each other probably having a really good chat around the dinner table about well-being and how um, and how this 
contributes to well-being and the, how networks contribute to well-being in the creative economy, which we might pick up later. Um, but we've got a pretty packed schedule. Um, we've got two more presentations and then we've got a couple of people who are going to offer um, some, some thoughts back. Um, we don't have time to bring the audience in um, in any kind of formal way, but we're going to ask you to put your questions in the chat and we're going to send those on to the speakers and get back to you. So there is a chance to interact. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to go on to our next speaker. Um, that's Butch Karangai, who's a creative entrepreneur, a design advocate, and a community crusader. That's such a good job title. Um, so in 2019, Butch led Cebu's successful bid to be designated UNESCO City of Design. Um, and he's been a national consultant for the United Nations Department of Social and Economic Affairs since 2020. He's going to talk about his work in the creative sectors of Cebu and the value of the Cebu City Design. Design Week in the city. So Butch, uh, please start your presentation by describing yourself. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. And good morning, UK, and good evening from Southeast Asia, everyone. My name is Butch, and I'm an Asian guy in his 40s who pretends to be in his 30s. I wear eyeglasses and currently have a blue button-down shirt on. I would like to thank British Council for giving me this opportunity to speak. I have quite a, light, a lot of slides to get through in 10 minutes, so let me jump just right in. Smack in the middle of the 7,000 plus islands that make up the Philippine archipelago is the historic and dynamic city of Cebu. It is the country's first Spanish settlement and the second largest metropolitan area. Cebu's diverse creative ecosystem spanned the gamut of creative domains with functional design as the largest category, followed by creative services, visual arts, and new media. Our award-winning furniture, home objects, fashion, and accessories are the main products in functional design and are distributed all over the planet. We also have a new international airport terminal that has received multiple international accolades for sustainable design, excellent customer service, and wide route network. Cebu is also home to Sinolog, one of the world's largest festivals that pre-COVID drew over 2 million tourists over a week-long creative extravaganza to celebrate the child Jesus and the city's distinction of being the cradle of Christianity in Asia. In 2019, Cebu was designated as a UNESCO City of Design, which had its roots 11 years prior when the British Council first identified the city as a premier creative hub of the Philippines. Cebu's designation gave us access to an even wider resource network that included the 40 plus cities of design and the nearly 400 creative cities worldwide. The, the announcement was also released as a few of us were en route on a UN study tour to Singapore and Bandung, Indonesia, both of which are also UNESCO cities of design. It was great to connect, learn, share, and get inspired by the design movements in each city. Upon our return, we had the obligatory round of celebrations before quickly getting to work. We mounted our first joint exhibit during the city's 83rd Charter Day and also assisted in the branding and delivery of the Cebu Integrated Bus Service, which reflected the UNESCO designation on its side panels. A week before the first round of lockdowns, the British Council of Philippines, together with Plymouth College of Arts, held the Making Futures Conference in Cebu, which brought participants from 20 countries to discuss how crafting communities can reinvent their roles in the context of global challenges. Little did we know then that COVID-19 was going to put an abrupt stop to the breakneck speed at which we had been operating in. In retrospect, it was probably a good thing since it forced us to take a breather, reassess and pivot. We took advantage of the time while on lockdown to gather and refine baseline data strengthen our networks in ways that were not possible pre-COVID, and learn new skills, not just to cope with the situation, but also to prepare for the eventual recovery phase. Despite being amongst the most impacted sectors, Cebu's creatives really stepped up to the plate and launched a barrage of COVID response efforts reflective of the diverse nature of the city's creative landscape. Cebu Design Week 2020 pivoted into a virtual three-day event that gathered design experts from all over the world, the Blue Mango Awards launched new categories to recognize creativity while in lockdown, acknowledge that it can be manifested anywhere, every day, and in many ways, and rewarded those who integrated design in the way they live, work, and play. 
my engagement with the UN's Department of Social and Economic Affairs as a national consultant generated a series of reports that comprehensively assessed pandemic impacts on Cebu's creative sector as a whole, as well as the different subsectors that comprise it. Part of the UN DESA initiative was the introduction of a business recovery toolkit for creative MSMEs that simpl simplified business frameworks to assist them in their post-COVID reboot. With COVID still very much a threat and recovery timeline still unclear, the following section will outline how we are planning to go forward and utilize creativity as many other cities around the world have done to help revitalize the devastation portions of our local economy. Upon extensive review, our original bid components from 2019 are still valid. Utilizing the talent, tech, tolerance, and tenacity that defines Cebu, we aim to evolve the city's creative infrastructure and energize the creative Cebu grid. They are designed to increase tourism, investments, and the production of creative goods and services for the local, national, and international markets. Ultimately, they're intended to have positive and sustainable impacts on the economic, social, and environmental dimensions. With resources severely constrained, we've had to prioritize higher revenue, lower effort projects based on predefined metrics such as revenue potential, maximum reach, and least amount of resources required. Short-term term projects are meant to real realize groups of concepts, which then lead to force multipliers in the longer term. Let me now briefly outline seven projects in the pipeline, pipeline that are meant to redefine Cebu's creative infrastructure. First is a street art project with, this, with Cebu's leading private foundation called Shots of Hope. It is part of a broader vaccination campaign in seven partner cities and municipalities. Next, we've aligned with the Cebu City Tourism Commission to promote creative tourism and are helping new develop new products through destination branding and wayfinding. We have reached out to Cebu's numerous maker spaces and shared service facilities to align plans and goals. There will also be an education component in this aspect since most of these spaces reside within academic campuses. Sometime next year, the National Museum is finally slated to open in the old Cebu Customs House. So it is timely that similar institutions in the area level up and rebrand as the Cebu Heritage Quarter, which will hopefully lead to UNESCO World Heritage ins Inscription. We're also aligning with substantial projects that are currently in development, in development adjacent to the historical core, such as the carbon, carbon market redevelopment, which will transform it into a world-class and first world public market, lifestyle destination, and transport hub. Longer term, we want to establish new or the Museum of Design, which is a physical converging point and repository for past, present, and future initiatives. It is also an enabling and actualization space that's meant to help designers realize and commercialize their ideas. A very new um, initiative is TRI, the Tropical Research and Innovation Institute, which is a multidisciplinary learning and teaching center to, of excellence to enhance, promote, and perpetuate island living. Now let's move on to the, to the Creative Cebu Grid, uh, which we'll talk about in six initiatives. The first is a design voucher program that's, that's inspired by UK initiative that aims to democratize design by pairing design professionals with marginalized youth and female entrepreneurs who have never availed of design services before. In four days, Cebu Design Week 2021 will return to an in-person event with the first Visayas Art Fair as the main feature. A mini design summit will also be held at the end of this week that will bring together local, local government, national agencies, the academe, civic society, and the private sector so that further needs are assessed and additional plans to bridge gaps and align initiatives can be made. During the summit, the Design School Gateway will also be launched. This online portal is meant to be a virtual converging point marketplace, networking tool, resource database, and enabling mechanism, not just for Cebu-based creatives, but for anyone interested in being part of the community. It is also during the summit that we will introduce the Philippine Creative Cities Develop Development Bill that is currently in Congress, the Philippine Creative Cities Network, and launch a Creative Cities Playbook. The PCCN originally started as an item in our wish list earlier this year, but thanks to Congress and the League of Cities of the Philippines, we already have 30 mayors who have signed up. It is meant to be a support group, incubator, and accelerator for cities who are intent in achieving UNESCO Creative Cities designation. All these initiatives, while mostly piloted and implemented in Cebu, are meant to be replicated elsewhere to amplify reach and maximize impact. 
They are also meant to dispel the fake news that creativity is not essential, when in fact it is critical, especially in the challenging times that we face. So by respecting the past, celebrating the present, and inspiring the future, we, we endeavor to energize and enable Cebu's creative practitioners and harness our sustainable networks, a substantial network, sorry, to help build a holistically sustainable city that excites and a Cebu that delights, that is not just livable, but also lovable. So with that, I end my segment, but the conversations will continue. Please reach out to me on any of the platforms that I've listed in my last slide, but isn't showing up. Uh, but I think it will be shared later. Uh, if you wish to be part um, of our journey, thank you very much. Wow, Butch, that's um, amazing. <laughs> I'm so sorry to run through it. <laughs> I can't believe you managed to get it into exactly the right amount of time. Such a lot of brilliant practice. And I guess already we're hearing themes across the panel of advocacy, support, growth. I'd love to talk about risk. But I guess I, one thing I really took from your talk was about inclusive innovation, I guess, and how networks can be used to address inequality, which I think is really exciting and I think really bears out in our post-COVID working as well, that, um, that th those networks that support each other and think about inequality are able to pivot um, more quickly. Yeah, especially now with the, with the, with the widening digital divide that we're seeing. So that's very, very important. Yeah, a really important part of our networks that um, that I hope that we'll come back to. Thank you very much, Butch. Um, I'm going to introduce our last speaker um, before we have the um, reflections from our guests, Tom and Deli. So uh, we've got Dwangrit Banang, um, who also I'm going to ask to start the presentation by describing themselves. Um, Dwangrit has been living life in his own practice. Um, Dwangrit Banang, Architects Limited, for the last 22 years. Um, in 2014, he renovated an old factory in Bangkok and turned it into the grand, groundbreaking The Jam Factory, which I looked at when we first met a couple of days ago and looks amazing. I'd really want to, to visit there. And today we're going to hear about his journey as a creative entrepreneur making impact in the amazing city of Bangkok. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um... My, um, my name is Dong Ribunak and I'm a mid-50s Asian with a lighter skin color, a hair a little bit curly, uh, slightly above my shoulder. And I'm wearing a very dark blue shirt, uh, the spectacle with a dark frame, very round spectacle. So that's me. And I want to begin with the idea of how uh, we can initiate the creative network really in a certain part of the city. As you just mentioned, in 2014, I uh, established uh, the, the venue called the Jam Factory out of the enthusiasm of to create a business. It's exact, uh, to be exactly, uh, we started out the Jam Factory as a venue for my own office, uh, the architecture firm DBALP. And uh, we have been working with so many expertise, so many people for so long. And I have foreseen the, uh, the future of the, a creative circle in Thailand and how we can initiate people to be more creative or more creative people engaged into this domain uh, without taking too much of a long time. I've been actually myself exploring the possibility of how we can create a person or we can, we can indulge a person into a creative industry as fast as possible. And I, I, I create the Jam Factory out of that doubt, okay? A Jam Factory is a place that uh, equipped it with the uh, certain uh, space, like, uh, the, the, well, technically the, the cafe, the space to create a certain event, the glass lawn, the big trees, um, the, the bookstore, the furniture store, of course, my own office, the restaurant, and all of this is built in the old factory uh, right to the riverfront. The, the jam factory is the idea of how we can create a space for some things or many things to happen, okay? And I discovered that in order to uh, create the network, the network of people or community needs space. And what we are delivering is we're delivering a space 
for the, those people to create something as we call a uh, uh, creative things. Okay. Um, before I get into that, I will eventually uh, tell, uh, give you the example of the, uh, there will be the short video afterward to explain on how the space is actually used and how the people is actually engaged into the space. The first part of the video was the image taken only last, uh, this last past weekend. We have uh, the event called the NAC market, which is an open, uh, open athlete market. And uh, it accepts the, uh, the, the interest for, for the smaller venue who, uh, 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 sorry, smaller shop who really want to sell a uh, craft, uh, food, and, and we also accept the invitation or uh, the, the interest for the, the music band to play in, in the venue. So this is the picture will show you how people engage into the space and how that possibility and how possible the space can create for them. Okay. And, and the next part of the video, we show the, the brief video taken from last few years event called Art Ground. Uh, the Jam Factory is a venue for Art Ground for four years. And uh, the, the video that you will see is a fourth Art Ground. And the Art Ground is a space for the young creative people to come and sell and work and watch on art. And art in the domain of the new generation, not in the old generation. So it's more vivid, it's more dynamic. And the art piece is more worked by the smaller name artists. And this is a very good opportunity for people to meet. And you will see from the picture how space can be creating something for the possibility of network to happen. Now, before I'm, I'm getting to that video, I want to talk to you about some few things, okay? What I discovered in the last 20 years, we, I discovered that creativity is a possibility within the context. So when you want to create something, the, the best question that you should be asking is what is possible within the context. And in this case, you know, in case of the creative space or a creative city, space, is the possibility. The space is a clearing for the possibility. The space is also a context in itself. So it's very important that we have to create a space as a blank sheet for people to create something. Without those space, there is a likely that creative network, creative community or creative event can be happening. So uh, first, when we try to uh, making the city more creative, I will uh, convincing authority just to do nothing but to create a space. So that is something that we discover. Creativity is a possibility within the certain context. The next thing I want to discuss about is what we call the silent knowledge. The silent knowledge is actually the knowledge which is uh, contradictory to the articulated knowledge. We all know the articulated knowledge, you know, is written. So everything that is, can be written is articulated knowledge. Everything that is written can be transferred. And once it can be transferred, it can be digitized and it can be copied. So the, va the value of those knowledge is reduced in the, uh, along the way. The silent knowledge is something opposition to that. Silent knowledge is only transfer by being together. So, and, and the, the silent knowledge can only be transferred by going it through times. So being together and times engagement is something very important for those uh, uh, silent knowledge to be transferred to other people. So being together is very important and being together through times is very important. This is how we will transfer the knowledge and that will eventually giving us the cultural wealth okay so i think now is a time that i show you the video so please uh, uh, uh play the video and i presume i will i'm seeing it or i'm not seeing it i'm not no but please do play the video yeah.
think uh, the, the video um, might now be showing you the, uh, the images I took uh, on the last weekend on the NAC market. And you can see how people engage themselves into the space of the jam factory. The jam factory set out the new phenomenon statement in the city of Bangkok by creating the term creative space to be more legitimate. And now I think, I think the idea of this creative space have been sprawling throughout the city. This is actually the picture is right here. Uh, you, you see right now is right after this weekend. So it's actually uh, just happening uh, uh, right now. The next video you're seeing right now is a clip that we took from the Art Ground event. So I'll let you watching that for the moment. Yes, and I think that's the it might give you the idea on how space work with people, how network of creative people can be uh, explored to that space. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I love the notion of creativity as possibility and that documentation really shows the power of being together. Um, there's a question I see about intangible and unmeasurable impact, which we'll try to come back to at the end. Um, I'm gonna pick up a couple of the questions which seem factual, so we might be able to pick those off. Um, we've got Larissa who asks, what is creativity or what is creatives? Um, there are whole schools of research develop, uh, develop devoted to uh, defining the creative economy. Tom might pick it up, um, but I'm thinking we're doing theater, dance, music, film, visual arts, design, craft, heritage, and creative technology, which I would say does include web design, Larissa, and gaming. Um, and Nikki has asked, um, in trying to understand the structure of the British government, which bits is most involved in British creative networks? And that's the Department for Digital um, Creative Media and Sport, um, Nikki, if you want to look up. And then there are several arm's length bodies like Arts Council, Design Council, that sit underneath that structure. So hopefully we can um, come back to some of the other questions if we get time. Um, but we're now going to hear from, um, so we're just going to check in on the illustration, actually, which is coming along amazingly. Um, I hope you're going to see Danny's screen right now. Um, Danny is imagining us in the dinner party of our dreams that we wish we were at right now, rather than our own houses on Zoom. Um, Danny, is there anything you want to say about uh, the illustration and, and what it is that's inspiring you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I guess it's just like, uh, I don't know, it's just something like a comfortable space that I imagine the speakers to be in. 
That's great. Lovely. So I hope you can see um, that the four of us who've spoken so far are sat around a dining table, which looks laden with delicious food um, and a beautiful cheering um, bunch of flowers in the middle. And we're uh, we're geeking out on creative economy networks right now. Um, so it's a good time to, to hear from our two other friends who are going to reflect on what we've heard so far. Um, first, I'm going to uh, welcome Tom Fleming and then Dina Delvan. Daliana. Um, Tom is um, a friend and colleague of mine. We often interact in networks and British Council events across the world. So I'm delighted when we end up on a panel together. Tom is the director of Tom Fleming Creative Consultancy, which works across every global region to develop cultural and creative strategies for nations, regions and cities. Um, and Tom's going to reflect on what he's heard so far. Tom, please, can you start with describing yourself? Thank you, Claire. So I'm a middle-aged man with uh, graying dark hair, glasses, and a, and a typically pallid complexion, uh, which is often associated with Monday mornings and November Monday mornings in particular. I have a green jumper on as well. Uh, this is a fascinating discussion, and it's great to be involved in it. And I suppose it also points to the power of networks, isn't it, Claire, in, in that we do find ourselves serendipitously, bump serendipitously bumping into each other both digitally and physically um, through the, the power of networks, the agency of being interconnected. And it's really interesting to hear the different perspectives from colleagues in, in Southeast Asia today. Um, I've got a few observations really, and I, I think they point to a, a, or, or a link to a bigger question as to, as to why network and, and what difference it can make in terms of energizing and mobilizing a creative sector that is built on uh, dialogue um, and is built on interdisciplinary transactions that is greater than the sum of its parts that can do much more than if we work individually or in, in relative isolation. Um, my first point, I think it's the point that somebody has to make is that when we talk about networks and we're often very celebratory in talking about networks, we also need to think about who's not in the room or who isn't part of the conversation. So often networks rightly are discussed in terms of how they can be these open, safe, inclusive spaces that provide pathways for engagement for people from, of difference from different backgrounds and that their power comes through the combination of voices which can drive collaborative practice which in turn drives innovation uh, but who isn't in that network who aren't you connecting with uh, I think that's really key and I love the notion of silent knowledge and I think we should also be focusing on silence in general um, when we think about um, developing and designing and driving networks for the creative economy and it's a particular challenge if the network starts to look and feel very similar um, and we you know, we need to thrive on difference if we're going to be genuinely building a sustainable creative sector um, but the examples we heard I think are genuinely progressive and the descriptions were of an inclusive approach to network development that was, has almost a mission focused approach to developing activities through networks. So the idea that a network is not just about the conversation, it's also about making impact came through very clearly in the, in the presentations that we've had. Uh, Marlin talked about the, the quadruple helix, which is a, I guess, a, a, an abstract understanding of how, or an abstract way of describing networks that bring together uh, the policy makers and the practitioners, civil society and the institutions. And those, that quadruple he helix from a perspective of sector development is really key because it enables you to have the building blocks in place to connect the intrinsic creative activities that are so vital for the arts and cultural sector to flourish to actually building them, bootstrapping them, building the skills, developing the investment, providing the, the, um, the, the infrastructure like spaces, like hubs, like cultural organizations. So you do need both the top down and the bottom up and to find that meeting point in, in, in between. Um, and you do need, as we've heard of the examples today, to have as much as possible a set of impact facing goals for effective network making. Um, we've been very lucky in the last um, 18 months to be doing quite a lot of focused research in, on the ASEAN creative economy, including a piece of work on festivals and the role that festivals have in uh, driving almost as catalysts or anchors for the creative industries. Um, but also we've been focusing on the um, on different cities for a whole portfolio of cultural city profiles. And what's interesting as an outcome of that research is that you can see how the creative industries flourishes most effectively where you have 
networks that fuse together towards a shared impact agenda. So festivals that focus on, for example, building the next generation of talent or that festivals that focus on sustainable development as, as a holistic agenda have been really transformational in terms of building opportunity and energy and scale in the creative industries. Um, and cities that have that fabric of different kinds of networks from the um, very social and emergent through to professional development networks are those that have in their locker, in their landscape, the capacity to develop and grow and go to the next level. And we heard that in, C in Cebu, where you have both the very informal, uh, the very, the very uh, emergent, but at the same time, we have the shared mission to develop and to grow and to keep pushing the city, keep challenging partners in the city to get to the next level you, with a series of horizons that you keep reaching, and then you go to the next horizon. Um, and I think we can see broadly festivals um, and uh, networks that come from festivals um, as almost like a social technology for the creative economy. And that, that they, uh, they're, they're a device for uh, transformation in, um, in sector development, in civic development, and in social development. Um, but I wanna go back to my point about power, just to uh, finish off, and, and the notion of who is involved. The COVID crisis, the pandemic, has brutally exposed the uh, structural inequalities that you have in the creative industries, the fragility of networks. And while there's been a lot of flourishing going on, and we heard that um, in Cebu, and I, I'm sure that it's the same, the same cases in Bangkok as well, there's also been a lot of fallout. Uh, so as we rebuild, uh, as we uh, go to the, the kind of post-COVID reality, we need to really attend to those who aren't in the conversation. And we need to ensure that networks are working collectively for shared purpose. Um, to reboot and reframe the creative industries. Uh, and just a point there on digital, in that we've all obviously um, succumbed to the, 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 the digital resource as a way of um, building new networks and retaining our existing ones. There is a digital divide, there's a widening digital inequality. And as we move into this sort of landscape of metaverse, et cetera, uh, this is uh, a, a genuine opportunity, but also a significant threat to inclusive development in the creative industries. So network, 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 fantastic. But who's not in the conversation is my major point to make today. Thank you, Tom, for that excellent uh, reflection and that important point for us all to consider. Um, I'm going to go straight on to Dina, who's also going to offer us a reflection. Um, Dina Delania is a lecturer and business incubation director at the School of Business and Management in the Institute of Technology, Bandung. Um, also a program director at the Global Center of Excellence and International Cooperation of Creative Economy. Um, Dina's active evolved in several startups and creative industries development activities in Indonesia. Um, so Dina, please describe yourself and uh, share with us your uh, take on today's presentations. Oh, okay, thank you so much, Claire. So uh, probably my name is Dina. I'm in my, I'm in my 37s. I'm Asian. I have a short black hair above my shoulder and I have a yellow, yellow skin and a big chubby cheek. Uh, I'm not wearing a blue shirt, which is my favorite color. Okay, um, well, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity. Actually, I'm, re I'm, I'm really glad um, um, to be here that I, I'm hearing a lot of uh, meaningful presentations. Mm -hmm. And um, here I'd like to emphasize about the creative enterprise and how um, every aspect of uh, the uh, previous speakers uh, uh, presents today is actually becoming the, the the main factors, the main drivers on how we can uh, grow the creative uh, enterprise further. So uh, uh, first, uh, we, we may uh, emphasize about ecosystem. So here in Indonesia, um, we, we just launched um, our new regulations uh, focusing on creative economic development. And we, uh, we, we know that uh, one thing that uh, we need to put attention to, uh, to, to help uh, development of creative enterprises, actually the ecosystem. So what are being presented by Marlene about uh, uh, creative network organizations, what being presented uh, uh, by um, doing it about the space and also what activations in uh, Cebu uh, presented by Bach is actually 
the the, the ecosystem itself on on how we can help the, the creative players grow and then at the end they can start to build to build some some uh, something we call as creative enterprise so first I, I would like to uh, to emphasize about the the first variable about the creative network organizations presented by um, Marlene yeah so here uh, we understand that uh, the, the the functions of creative network organization is very important that it connects people with different uh, backgrounds and uh, skills yeah and 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 we know that uh, everything's uh, coming inside of it yeah particularly the the, the knowledge transform uh, transforms information are transform and then um, the output would be would be something tangible and intangibles and and, and sometimes it, it it gave birth to creative enterprises and then the creative enterprises can give back to the to the creative network organizations. However, um, I would like to to uh, to remind you that it is not really uh, it is not that easy to organize the, uh, these creative network organizations. We understand that um, uh, one thing that we have to uh, pay attention is about impact, like uh, what what Tom being said before. We we have to make sure that this uh, creative network can give impact, and we have to make sure that inside the organization itself, it has to be a good engagement, and we have to make sure that there will be a collective actions inside the network itself. And we 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 understand that, that if uh, there's no champion to activate the network itself, it the network will be like like just stop uh, being a network. So we uh, the, to have to find the, the right champion to make sure that the network can actually grow and keep giving some a good impact is, is actually not not that easy. So that's why I really understand that um, having a good uh, person in charge yeah, to manage this network is really important. And, and the second thing, the, the creative network need to be held by a good ecosystem. So uh, what what being presented by batch uh, availability of uh, education, physical space, events, marketplaces, etc., incubators, accelerators, uh, could be uh, one of the uh, some of the examples of uh, how we can uh, start to build an ecosystem. We have to have uh, people who can who can connect all of these uh, infrastructures, who can activate, who can, who can um, actually uh, make the impact on, on all of these infrastructures. So um, the, the, the key to safety would be how to make sure the ecosystem is become sustainable. And it's not only because of the, uh, we want to be acknowledged as, as uh, for example, as a good example of creative city, but how to make sure that the ecosystem of this creative city and creative network is become sustainable. And we have uh, someone who can be, uh, uh, we may say at the, the someone who will become the, the regenerations of the next uh, activator yeah, of this ecosystem. And um, also the, uh, the space, the networks yeah, will, uh, will actually cherish the ecosystem itself. And then this sustainable ecosystem will actually uh, give birth to many, many uh, 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 creative enterprises, uh, which then can give a, uh, good impacts, and then they will give back again to the ecosystem and the society. So um, I guess uh, all the three speakers are emphasizing the the, the right variables, and um, I guess uh, the the main point would be about the human itself. Come back to our roots as a creative uh, industry is actually the human itself. So um, what we have to make sure that uh, who will be who will taking care of all uh, all of these activations. Yeah. So. Um, so this is actually our part that um, everything is, is not only about the space, not only about the activation, but also, however, the human itself is really important, the creative people itself. So I guess uh, that's all from me here. Dina, thank you so much. That's um, that's so great. Again, just loads of um, loads of things to think about in these packed discussions from our panel. Um, so I'm going to pick up on three of the questions that we've had from the audience, and I'm going to ask our panelists to be painfully brief um, in their responses because we don't have a great time, and then we're going to go back and have a look at the illustration that's being created afterwards. Um, so first, I'm going to come to you, Duangri, and I'm going to ask you a question that's been posed by Shri um, and um, he wanted to talk about conflict I guess what's the best mm. way to um, determine um, an approach or strategy for minimizing differences amongst those creatives being together 
I, I, I think the question is about how to minimize the difference. And, and I don't, don't agree with that. I think the diversity is a key to creativity. So I think the, the idea of the space that can embrace diversity is very important. So the architect who designed the space or people who are actually organized the space, they have to be well embraced that diversity. Because for me, I mean, the diversity is the only key to the next generation or evolution to, toward creativity. I totally agree. Um, and I was going to add that um, a really long time ago, when we first set up Pervasive Media Studio, we were very inspired by John C. D. Brown's work on creation nets and how you hold and organize diversity. So, Shri, that might have some interesting stuff for you. It's very Googleable and you can um, take a look at it. So, mm -hmm. I'm going to come to Butch for the next question. And this has been um, sent in by Diego, who wants to know whether you've got experience of um, thinking about the indirect impact of the work that you do on other sectors so things that aren't necessarily part of the cultural industries um yeah we have a little bit i mean we actually started um uh we started with assessing real life impacts on creative industries outside the regular frameworks for our unesco bid um, we use the creative trident approach to account for designers and support staff in creative industries along with embedded designers in non-creative industries. Um, we utilize government data and industry value chains, but as you can imagine, that data is very few and far in between, especially in a country like the Philippines. Um, currently, there is a larger design mapping effort by the Design Center of the Philippines, as well as the British Council, that is currently ongoing. Um, and hopefully that will yield much better data uh, from our efforts of last year. Great, thank you. And the last question is to Marlene um, around, um, it's asking for a guesstimate of the unmeasurable and intangible benefits of networks. Um, and I'm guessing you might actually have some actual hard research on this. Um, but, but what do you think? Apparently a hand waving approximation is also fine. Yeah, I mean, the, the word unmeasurable makes it exactly <laughs> the problematic thing about it to estimate it. Um, I did some research before the, the joining the DOT report around um, especially reputation and image creation. Based on survey data, they actually, it was said they would, um, media companies, it was specifically media companies, but I my assumption is this also works for all kinds of creative industries, is that the image and the reputation of the place decides in which network, which place you're going to choose to work in. And it was really by far the most important uh, measure of all of the different factors that might make a creative choose a place to work. So in that sense, it really shows that this is something that has become one of the most important driving factors. It's hard to put it into numbers, yes, but I would agree that it's the intangible placemaking, image creation, but also the social cultural impacts are um, way outweighing even the economic impacts, yes. Thank you. And it's um, it definitely one of the networks that we've been really involved in is the Southwest Creative Technology Network in the last um, in the last couple of years. We definitely set out to broaden the networks out of creative industries and saw some fascinating work in health and well-being and agriculture um, that, that we've just released a report on. So if you're interested, the Southwest Creative Technology Network picks up some of those things. Um, we felt that rather than growing our network, we would try to grow grow our connectivity and the corridors between multiple networks. Um, and that seemed to be an approach that really worked there. Um, we don't have any time for anything else. I'm really sorry if we haven't got around to your um, questions. I'm going to ask the team to just put us onto the animation slide so we can look at our beautiful illustration of us all having fun around the dinner table. We've got some candles that have joined us. Um, I feel like we would stay here for quite a long time drinking quite a lot of wine and discussing how this stuff works out in all of our countries. Um, but I'm going to bring us to a close whilst you as the audience take a look at that. And um, I'm going to say I hope you found the session as useful and as packed as I did. Don't forget that the event carries on until Thursday. You can look at the country pavilions, which are packed with resource materials, research, insight reports and videos.
And don't forget there are loads of ways to network so that you can drop in and meet each other. Um, the event is the last session of today, but as I said, it carries on across Thursday and the main stage discussions are being recorded. So if you can't see anything else for the rest of the day, you can drop in and look at those later. Um, I'd really like to thank the British Council for organising this event. To Danny, um, I hope you had a really great time imagining our dinner party and what it would be like if we all got together, Danny. Is there anything you want to say? No, I'm good. Thank you so much for the opportunity <laughs> to listen to everyone. This was wonderful. Well, I'm raising a glass around the table to you and your quite incredible speed of animating our discussion. Um, and I'm going to thank our speakers very much, Marlene, Birch, Dwangreet, Tom, Delhi, um, and you, the audience, for coming to listen to us today. Thanks and see you soon. All right. Thank you.